Hi, everybody. My name is Robbie Lockman. I'm an evangelist at Harness and very excited to be talking at Google Cloud Next. Uh, I had a lot of outages in my day, so hopefully we can learn a little bit uh, how not to get burned. But also with me is my esteemed colleague, Brett. Brett? Hi, I'm Brett zane -Ullman. I'm an engineering manager here at Harness, and I'm excited to be here today. Go ahead, Robbie. Perfect. So what are we going to be talking about today? So at Harness, we've actually went through a pretty big migration on GCP, but a little bit of level setting. What on earth is Harness? And we'd like to decide our time before GCP, our time on the way to GCP, and our time on GCP. So very nicely segmented here. So in the beginning, let's talk a little bit about Harness. A divine light came down and shined upon the continuous delivery world, and Harness was born. So, so again, a bright light shined. So what are we actually talking about here? Uh, we're talking about Harness. At Harness, we're a continuous delivery as a service. So what does that mean? A continuous delivery as a service is something that helps orchestrate a couple of parts for you. So getting your software or your platforms into production uh, really requires orchestration between approvals, uh, all the confidence building steps that you have, such as testing, and also just a way to do release, right? So if you, are you leveraging a, a safe type of release like a canary? Do you see the canary doing a dab there? Uh, are you doing a blue-green? Um, these terms are uh, new to you, don't worry. You know, we'll be here after the, after the presentation uh, to kind of answer some questions. But uh, Harness really packages all that up for you as, as a service. Also, since we have a lot of customers that depend on us, uh, we always have to be up. And so what the Harness platform does uh, is exactly that. You know, we've, we're supporting over 100 enterprises, uh, thousands of community users, and also hundreds of thousands of deployments regularly. Ironically, we actually help empower people coming and talking on stages and different technology conferences because if you're looking at where their applications go, most likely they could be using Harness in the background to help deploy that. And so what do we deal with at Harness? We actually have some unique cha challenges at Harness uh, is that we have a, a SaaS version of a product, so people expect uptime all the time. But also, we're supporting two other type of cloud deployment models. We, I like to call it kind of SaaS, right? So certain customers might not like being completely in, in the public cloud. And so there's limited connections. They're running parts of the Harness platform with their hardware. And also, we have a completely air gap version. I call it no sassing around. Uh, of the product so customers can be completely disconnected again and trying to leverage the harness platform and so what are some of the challenges of, of, of the platform right because again we have to maintain three different versions of our platform so the first thing before our time on gcp was scaling of the platform was basically non-existent we had a very rigid architecture uh, and brett will walk through that in a couple of minutes also this was our first foray into kubernetes actually none of our workloads for ourselves were hosted or deployed on the Kubernetes. Now, a lot of our customers are using Kubernetes, but it was actually our first foray into Kubernetes when we went to GCP. And also, we had no separation of duty, right? So what that means is that uh, we didn't have lower environments deploying to other different lower environments. Basically, our prod environments that we were building the platform on deployed straight to prod. So we had a lack of separation of duties. And also, we had multiple versions of the platform, which was becoming difficult to maintain. And also, we were completely on SaaS. So that means that any sort of downtime for us uh, would be very detrimental to the customers. And so, about to hand it over to Brett, let's talk about our time, Brett, uh, before the mighty GCP. Brett? <laughs> sure, Ravi, thanks. Uh, so as Ravi mentioned, uh, our production environment prior to moving to GCP uh, was pretty rigid. Um, this is basically what it looked at looked like. It's very simple. Uh, we had just a couple of EC2 instances that were hosting our UI, which is just some static content, uh, and then three other VMs uh, running our orchestration servers and connecting to our database. Uh, each one was behind a load balancer, and that was pretty much it. What we had to do uh, is update every time we want to deploy a new version. And Harness is a de deployment tool. So of course, we're using Harness to deploy Harness. But at this time, we didn't have any other environment set up for deploying to production. So production deployed itself. Uh, and how did this work? So our servers, which are called managers, uh, orchestrate workflow executions during a deployment. But the actual calls 
uh, to deploy and update a service are done by a worker or delegate uh, in the customer environment. So in this case, uh, being our own customer, our delegate is in the same VPC as the servers. And while the workflow runs, it goes through one server at a time, updating the binary and restarting the service. This is all well and good, except that during the course of the deployment, the orchestration engine itself gets updated to a new version. And since it relies on communicating back and forth with the delegate, it's very sensitive to data model changes that may have been introduced by the new version. Of course, if this goes wrong and hangs, then you get stuck with production in an intermediate state. And now it's time to introduce Kubernetes. So given all the challenges that we had, uh, looking to really leverage Kubernetes to help overcome that. A lot of our customers are moving towards Kubernetes and also our, app, our platform actually deploys to Kubernetes. So the next rational step for us uh, was actually to be going towards Kubernetes. Uh, Brett, let's talk about uh, some reasons why we were looking to leverage our very own Kubernetes. Sure, Ravi. So as Ravi mentioned, over the first year that we even had a production environment, we saw the rise of Kubernetes in popularity. Uh, it was becoming more and more popular with our customers. And so we wanted to leverage that for ourselves. Our primary goal was to dockerize our microservices and start using Kubernetes. And when we looked around at the time, uh, GKE was really the best and one of the only hosted Kubernetes services. We already had Kubernetes support in harness on GKE. So why not leverage that and use it for ourselves? So we built out the infrastructure uh, and defined all of our Kubernetes configuration in Harness to deploy all of our microservices, uh, exposing an Nginx ingress controller via a load balancer, and then routing to our various services. So once this had been working in QA for some time, we were ready to make the switch in production. Um, so making the migration uh, is what we're here for. So let's talk about that. Yeah, this is what the people came for. <laughs> we have two. We have two pieces of infrastructure now. How do we make the switch? And Brett, Brett's a genius at this stuff. It is so. Let's kind of gearing up towards the switch. Uh, kind of the ethos that we have at Harness is that we help enable people doing production changes uh, in normal hours, right? If you kind of take a look back at that years gone by, usually you're deploying during a green window or a black window. Pick your color, right? It's two or three in the morning. And everyone's tired, right? And so since we help enable people make this type of deployment or very critical deployments in normal business hours for their geography, we decided to, to, to drink our own champagne or eat our own dog food that, hey, let's do a dinner time switch because we had two sets of teams. So around dinner time in San Francisco uh, is actually breakfast time in India. So uh, for all the resources that we had to line up, um, it, it made the best sense for us to do it around dinner time. And so, Brett, let's talk a little bit about the, the switch that we had to do. Sure. So we were migrating not only our own infrastructure, but also our database, uh, which is a hosted Atlas MongoDB cluster. Uh, while the old production instances on the left were still live, uh, we deployed and brought up the new Kubernetes stack, uh, pointed at the database that was still in AWS at the time, just to make sure it was running fine uh, while well connected to the production DB, but without any traffic reaching it yet. So once that worked, uh, we scaled it back down. Then for the database, we live migrated the data over to another Atlas cluster, this time hosted in GCP. The data there was keeping pace with the live production database with a few seconds of lag. Then to make the switch, we took a few minutes of downtime uh, turn down the old production instances so that they stop writing to the database, then wait a few moments for the database live migration to catch up completely. Then we finalized the data migration. So then we reconfigured the new Kubernetes manager to point to the new database in GCP and redeployed with Harness. So once that was up and verified on our end, the only thing left was to switch the DNS entry to the IP of the new load balancer. Awesome. And not want, wanting to do the big reveal, but it's in the title of our presentation. How long do you think that actually took us to make to, to kind of execute the DNS switch? And <laughs> <laughs> the big reveal, this is actually live Slack from uh, when we made the switch. It was a total of 76 minutes. And uh, you know, it, it was very impressive uh, that this change uh, 
only took 76 minutes for us to execute. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about what this, the final ecosystem looked like for us, uh, given the benefits and the, some of the lacking stuff we had in our old uh, architecture, Brett. Sure. So I mentioned previously some of the problems with the self-deployment model uh, and the data model changes that that can uh, uh, you know, cause problems when we upgrade ourselves. So what we've done now, we've added a number of new microservices, and we've introduced a new internal uh, harness environment that deploys production. So we're not self-deploying anymore. And uh, we've also introduced versioning to address the data model changes that I mentioned. So the payload is synchronized between the servers and the workers at all times uh, via the versioning. So now we're able to quickly scale using GKE and meet new demand uh, or deal with production issues. Uh, this is an example of what our pipelines look like while they're running. And uh, you know, with the product, using these types of pipelines, we're able to wrangle all the configuration that you need to stand up your services. Uh, and that definitely helped us when we were changing both the cloud provider and the deployment model at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just kind of adding to some of Brett's points there, uh, you know, we we are a continuous delivery uh, company, and it, it really shows the importance for making such a big infrastructure change that to actually leverage a pipeline. You know, as we were going through the development and also the testing of this, uh, it, it's kind of interesting as the kind of the shift of infrastructure to the cloud allows for a lot more iteration. And so running the pipelines, kind of testing out what would happen in um, success scenarios, what would happen in failure uh, scenarios, was quite important. So it wasn't all this is the first time we're doing something. You know, there was a lot of trial and error to get to get this right. Uh, but with all of that, with all the trials and tribulations, right, we made a fairly big change, and it's it's you know it's really paid off for us uh, partnered with with Google Cloud that we're able to a we're increasing the number of customers that we have, the infrastructure is scaling appropriately, and just really allowing us to kind of grow and scale our business. And so don't forget, you know, after all this is done, it's a celebrate success, and really looking at a very simple equation for what is success, right? So there was certainly a lot of prep work, right? So gathering and planning, uh, taking inventory of what you have, uh, making sure that these these particular pieces, especially as we started to more move towards more dockerization, right? It was a very, very a traditional approach that we took. Also for execution, make sure you have the right staff in place. If it's two or three in the morning, it doesn't do anybody a favor, right? If it's, you know, time that everyone's awake, um, you're certainly more, more alert. And also the journey is never over, right? A, a common thing that we like to ask uh, our prospects and customers is, hey, when is your deployment over? It's kind of an intrinsic question. Because uh, again, you always want to make sure that you're always refining, continuously improving uh, what you do have. That kind of kind of lasting impact that we have for on Google Cloud, even le leveraging technologies like GKE, you know, when we have new engineers, even from field sales to customer su uh, su support to uh, even engineering where Brett's at, uh, teaching them on Kubernetes, uh, GKE makes it easier for us, right? So they have an easy way to kind of see and play with Kubernetes. And thanks once again for catching our presentation. Brett and I really appreciated uh, you coming to catch our talk. And hopefully we can catch up with everybody uh, in person one of these days. Cheers.